You're listening to the Doc Lounge Podcast. This is a place for candid healthcare conversations with physician recruitment industries, top executives, and thought leaders. This podcast is made possible by Pacific Companies, your trusted advisor in physician recruitment. My name is Summer Gilbert, and I am the Director of Marketing and Branding here at Pacific Companies. Today on the podcast, we have Dr. Melanie Lin. She's a board-certified internist working in our neck of the woods, Orange County, California. Because she's in Orange County, we're super lucky, and she's in the studio with us today. Super fun to have face-to-face conversations. So thank you so much, Dr. Lin, for being here. Joining the conversation, we also have my coworker, Director of Recruitment, Casey Galpin. Dr. Lynn is incredibly inspiring. She's been practicing medicine for only about 10 years. So she's relatively young and she's already in a leadership role. And not only is she in a leadership role, but she's a medical director managing an entire region in Southern California. So talk about a go-getter. She's driven. She's incredibly passionate about medicine. So I cannot wait to talk to her. Let's just jump right into it and get started. So let's just kind of start from the beginning. Why did you choose to go into medicine? You know, it's kind of a funny story. Um, This is the one time that media actually really helped, um, and it helped me make a good decision. I was watching a TV show, 2020. I don't know if you're familiar Mm -hmm. with it. But they were doing a documentary on five brothers, and they were all physicians. And so they were talking about um, the joys of medicine and how they would choose it again. And I was about 10 or 12 um, at that time. And I remember I was just so impressed by their dedication. And then they interviewed their mother. And their mother, of course, was so proud and was talking about how she's happy that she raised kids that could contribute to society. And I just thought, what a great way to really give back. And so I decided this is going to be my my career path. So you knew early. Yeah, yeah. What did your parents say about that? You know, I I remember that day I told my mom. I went into her bedroom and I said, Mom, I'm going to be a doctor. And she laughed. And she's like, no, you're not. (laughs) It's, you know, it's it's so much work. It's really hard. She's like, you'd be really good as a piano teacher. And so I think that (laughs) motivated me more. Yeah. Yeah. A little different avenue there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Going into medicine, why did you choose internal medicine? You know, I, I love internal medicine because you get to know a little about everything. So cardiology, GI, neurology, um, you learn about all the different aspects of the body and how they tie together. Um, and what I like in particular about family medicine is you have the continuity of care. So I love the idea of prescribing a medication for a problem and then following up with a patient and, and just seeing their progress and how you know, I've been able to help them. So that's really been something I've enjoyed. So when you're finishing up in your internal medicine residency, I'm sure the question everybody has is, do I just stop here? Or do I go on to a fellowship where you can do anything, especially of medicine, after internal medicine residency? What's the kind of the decision-making process you go through to say, you know what, I'm gonna jump into practice, I wanna do this, I wanna have continuity of care, versus, going into a fellowship? Right, that's a great question. So I think it's really important to know yourself and know your strengths and your weaknesses Um, because really you're picking something that you're going to do for the rest of your life. So you really have to be aware of what you're good at. So if you're really good at procedures, then you should go into a specialty that is more procedural. If you love talking to people and communicating and, and getting to the root of emotional issues, then probably psychiatry is a good field for you. So it really depends on um, what your strengths are. For me, I love, um, again, the continuity of care. So seeing families, you know, and seeing um, the progress that patients can make when you motivate them, uh, that's something that really gets me up in the morning. And did your residency program, did you get enough exposure to the other subspecialties of internal medicine to really give you an accurate idea of this is really what I want to do. Do they, do you really develop that opportunity for you? Yes, absolutely they did. So I actually went to medical school thinking that I was going to be a surgeon. Hmm. And so, you know, I had wanted to do that for many years. And then I did the surgical rotation and I realized this is not for me. Hmm. 
So um, it's really important to get exposure to different fields, you know, and, and when you're in residency, it's really an opportunity for you to learn. You know, my program director would always say, in residency, eat when you can, sleep when you can. Yeah. Hmm. And I would add, learn when you can, right? So um, when you're in a situation where you're, you're not sure what to do, you're in a safe environment where you can ask. You can ask, um, you can get different opinions, you can research. You, you have that luxury that you may not have in the professional world. Hmm. Now, uh, maybe even because I'm sure there's going to be medical students that are kind of thinking about residency right now. But is is residency as bad as advertised as far as how many hours you're working? We hear crazy mm-hmm. stories about being on call for 48 hours straight. And is it really that intense for all of them or? Uh, well, for my residency, yes, it was okay. it was very intense. Um, when we were doing ICU call, we mm-hmm. were doing every three nights overnight call. And I, they've since changed it, but it, it was very intense. Um, and so I go back to eat when you can, sleep when you can. <laughs> yeah. You know, it, it really is a, a place where you can learn. Yes, you're tired. Um, you know, you're overwhelmed sometimes. But the amount of learning, you're not going to get that anywhere else. Absolutely. What advice would you give um, a resident going to go into the fellowship to pick what specialty they want? Um, So it's really about your strengths. So, um, for example, if you if you like something that's more intense, um, then you should go into something in the acute setting, maybe emergency medicine, Mm -hmm. urgent cares. If you like continuity of care the way that I do, then um, family medicine would be a better fit. I, I think it's all about fit. So you really have to um, do some uh, introspective thinking and and see what you're good at and what you're weak at. If you uh, could go back and change your specialty, what would be your second choice? My second choice? You know, I've I've always liked surgery. So, um, you know, if I could, I think I would go back and maybe um, try to work on my procedural skills a little bit more. Um, It's just something I've always liked and something I've been interested in. Um, but, but I'm very happy with my choice. Got you. So the, what would you say is, did you wish you knew in residency now that you're out, you have the experience, you were looking back like, man, I wish I really would have either paid more attention to this or wish I would have done this or would have known this. What advice can you give somebody who is currently in doing their internal medicine residency? You know, I think it's, it's mindset. So I think a lot of residents, when they're going through their residency, they, they just want to get through it. Mm. You know, they want to get to the other side. But take that time and enjoy it because it's, it's a time where you can learn, you can ask, you can experience different specialties. You can, you know, um, have different mentors. It's really a great opportunity. And it's, it's a shame to just go through it thinking, I just want to finish and I just want to, you know, start my job. Because when you start your job, you're not going to have that support that you have in residency. Okay, you know, obviously you did um, internal medicine. The other aspect of primary care would just be just a family practice. What makes somebody do IM, not FP, where you can do either one of them, but you went into internal medicine? I did, and the, and the reason I did that was because I, I enjoyed hospitalist work, okay. and so I was a hospitalist um, for a couple years, mm-hmm. and it was just something that um, I wanted to try out, and I enjoyed it, but then I, I realized that I, I like the, the clinic setting. Mm-hmm. It was just a better fit for me. And is, is not seeing kids or adolescents, is that something that you you wish you could do or you wish you go, going back that if you did a uh, family practice, obviously you're able to see kids. Is that something that you think you're that you would want to do? You know, for me, I, I think I'm I'm, I'm good with mm-hmm. internal medicine. Um, you know, kids are 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 very different. They're mm-hmm. not little adults. You know, they're <laughs> they have different biology. I mean, they're they're different, and so I think that my focus on the geriatric and kind of older population is is a good fit for me. Now, would you? What would be your recommendation if somebody if somebody is looking at geriatrics of the difference of doing the Jerry Fellowship versus not? It is there a big going to be a big benefit to doing a Jerry Fellowship in your eyes? 
So if you're doing a family medicine um, fellowship, you get to see a wide range of ages. And if that's the kind of setting that you like, then a geriatric fellowship is not, um, is not as needed. But if you're really focused on seeing an older population and, and that's really um, the demographic that you want to focus on, it's, it's great to get that experience. Yeah, so it kind of goes back to the original answer that you gave is know yourself have an idea of what you have a passion for, what's really going to get you excited for the next 20, 30 years of your career and follow that. Absolutely. So I guess the question, how does somebody when they're, you know, in their late twenties, early thirties come to that idea of this is what my passion is. And that's where residency is great because Mm. you get to experience different things. Now keep in mind though, what you experience may not be, um, you know, a good representative of what it actually is. Let's say you're doing a cardiology elective and you just, you hate it. It's not something you want to do, but it it may be for other reasons. Maybe you're driving too far to the Mm -hmm. location. Maybe, you know, you don't like the office building. So keep in mind that there may be external factors, but um, in picking a field, I, I think that what's important is couple of things. Continuity of care. Do you like that? Do you like the acute setting versus, um, you know, a non-acute setting? Do you like talking to people or do you like, you know, reading radiology films? So, I mean, these are all very different things. So I think you would have a general idea of what's a better fit for you. And it's going to be kind of weird, but does does the potential long-term income does that come into play at all? Obviously, we know if you go into GI, cardiology, the amount of money can be, you know, incredible, eight, nine hundred, a million dollars. Does that come into play, do you think, or do you think that's something that they should consider? Um, it's definitely something that you can consider and you should consider, but it shouldn't be a make or break, uh, deal breaker situation. Um, it's great to make a lot of money. Of course, you know, we, we need money for things. But at the end of the day, if you're doing something every day that you're not passionate about, you know, that's that's not going to be a meaningful life for you. Yeah, as a recruiter, that's probably the number one thing that we hear from new uh, new graduates, new residents, new fellows. Most of them, a lot of them change jobs after the first two years. And oftentimes the first job is I want the money there for the last 12, 14 years, you haven't made any. So they say, I want a job where I'm making a lot of money. I don't care where it's at. Then they go there and they don't like the practice. They don't like the people that they're working with. Their scope of practice is not what they're passionate about. And they say, I'm, I'm, that was a mistake. I'm not taking the job for the money. Now I want to find what's the right professional job for me. Where am I going to be happy? And they re, they move there. So they're not necessarily worried about the first job they take. They go after the money a lot, but they're relocating. They're changing jobs two years later. They say, you know what? Being happy and being in the right professional job is going to be more of a priority than an extra 50, 70 grand. Absolutely. Absolutely. Burnout is a, is a real issue. If you're doing something you're not passionate about and that you don't enjoy, you're going to burn out in a couple of years. And then you're going to be in a worse situation than when you started. Yeah. And uh, talking about burnout, the number one burnout rate in medicine is hospitalists doing seven on seven off 12 hour shifts. You did that. I did. So did. what was your experience as a hospitalist? Because you do that just out of training, correct? correct? Correct. What was your experience as a hospitalist? Well, I'm no longer a hospitalist. <laughs> <laughs> no, I enjoyed it. Uh, you know, there was a lot of learning that went on. Um, very intense, lots of long hours. Um, it was a good experience. I, I think as a lifestyle, it just wasn't for me. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I, I know a lot of friends who are hospitalists and they love it. They love it. And they love the, the week off. You know, they go on vacation. They go to Hawaii. They go, you know, wherever. Mm-hmm. So speaking of lifestyle, how is your current work-life balance? It's, it's pretty good. It's pretty good. I'm not going to say that it's fantastic, but it is, it is good. Um, you know, my hours are usually from 8 to 6.30. And then I go home and I get that time to myself. And if I want to pick up extra shifts on the weekends, I can do that too. Okay, so is that from what you've seen, kind of a normal schedule for outpatient internal medicine? It is. It is. You know, 
of course, you're going to be required to work a couple hours over your, your normal hours, just playing catch up and calling patients back, um, going through your paperwork. So it, it takes a lot of dedication. So you're saying that you're not working just 40 hours a week. Correct. Really any job. Correct. As a, as a physician, you put the 40 in. You're doing a couple of extra. Is that accurate? Absolutely. I mean, you can try to just get that 40 hours, but, you know, we're physicians. We come into medicine to try to make a difference and take care of patients. So when you have to put in the extra hours, you do it. Got you. So your transition from hospitalist to outpatient, you walk us through that process of why you choose that, you make that decision, and how has that transition been for you in your career? So I've done primary care for 10 years now. So that's been the, the bulk of my career at this point. Um, I went into, into hospitalist work because of the hours. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I liked having that week off. But then that week on was just, it was, it was difficult. Um, it was very, very intense. Mm-hmm. And so, I, you know, I wanted something different. And so I tried primary care and I loved it. And so I've just continued with that since then. What's your absolute most favorite thing about doing primary care? I love seeing families. So when I can see, you know, a great grandmother and then a grandmother and then the parent and and, um, they bring their kids along. It's just it's great to see that um, that family unit and to know that I take care of them. It's, It's really such an honor. Because you're in Orange County, do you have a pretty large uh, patient volume? I do. I do. Um, You know, panel is assigned to us. And so, you know, we always try to get as many patients as we can so we can build our panel. So how large is your patient panel right now? How many patients would you, if you're doing a full day clinic, what's the normal volume for you? Um, For a day in clinic, it's about, uh, I would say, 18 to 21 patients. And is that a pretty comfortable volume or are you finding yourself kind of rushing a little bit? You know, doing primary care is like being on a treadmill going full speed. (laughs) So you really, you have to really take care of yourself so you can function optimally at work because the pace is, um, is intense. So from eight to 12, you're seeing patients um, every 15, 20 minutes. And then you get your lunchtime where you're usually uh, working and calling patients. And then after that, you know, you, uh, you see patients again. So eat when you can, sleep yeah. when you can. <laughs> what is the craziest case that you've had so far? You know, I've, I've seen a lot of crazy things. You know, I, I think the saddest cases are when um, patients come in and they've known they've had an issue for a long time and they, don't, they haven't taken care of it. So, you know, I had a patient who had um, just a large growth on his arm that clearly he's had for, you know, 10 years, but he's never taken care of it until now. And I asked him, well, why? And he said, well, I didn't want something bad to be there. And it wasn't anything bad, but just cosmetically, it was, it was very shocking. So the, uh, you've just in your own personal career, you've, uh, progressed very rapidly. I know you're in a more of a leadership role now. You've had that for quite a while. What's the idea behind getting into more of a leadership role? We have a lot of physicians that want nothing to do with leadership. They want to just see patients, do their eight to five, go home. You've taken on a lot of additional responsibility in your career. How do you decide this is the avenue I want to go on doing part admin, part clinical versus staying just clinical? You know, I've always been very interested in population health. So for me, the idea of being able to affect patient care on a more, on a more uh, global scale was very interesting to me. So inst- for me, I feel like instead of taking care of patients one-on-one, now I have the opportunity to take care of patients by the hundreds, by affecting mm-hmm. policies, by affecting you know, the way we outreach to patients, by affecting you know, how we screen. So it just um, was a great opportunity for me. And it's something that I really enjoy. And so if, if you're overseeing other physicians, do you have, see that as, as a somewhat of a challenge? You guys are all have the same training, education, background for the most part. You're all equals, but you're in a leadership role, especially as a female. How does that impact your day-to-day kind of work life? 
You know, I, I really feel like it's important to lead by example. So I don't necessarily feel like I'm their boss. It's more like this is how I conduct myself and this is how I take care of my patients. This is my referral process. And I hope that you can do the same. And if there's, um, you know, a policy or, you know, something like that that needs to be um, implemented, then, of course, I'll have that discussion with them. And it's important also to get their feedback because sometimes we can implement things that don't work. And we need to follow up and say, well, why, why didn't this work? Why, um, why were you not happy with this policy? So communication is really key. And do you find that most physicians are pretty receptive to they that are. model? They are. You know, I think that physicians sometimes um, can be unhappy about certain mm-hmm. things. But if they have the opportunity to at least talk about it and to at least express their dissatisfaction, I think that goes a lot into, um, into making a good workplace. How do you feel your autonomy is? It's great. It's great. I don't feel like... I'm, I'm really that limited in anything. Um, I'm able to refer. I'm able to, um, you know, get my patients to see specialists that are excellent. So overall, I'm, I'm very happy with the autonomy. You know, what, like then what do you say is the, uh, the most challenging aspect of being a physician? I think the responsibility of caring for another human being you know, multiple human beings, um, I think that pressure sometimes can get um, overwhelming. So and it's hard to go home at night and just leave it behind because you don't. You know, you bring your work back with you. You think about your patients. You know, you call them at 9 o'clock at night just to check on them. So it's, it's that responsibility. But the responsibility um, is also very sweet in a sense because you feel like, you're in this world for a reason. You're, you're contributing. Um, you know, my mom always tells me, make the world a better place than when you found it. And so I, I think, you know, that's what I'm trying to do through my career. So how do you deal with that, of uh, the, the pressure? Is, as an internist and uh, working with geriatric population, you're dealing with a lot of very serious uh, cases at times. So Obviously, you say you take some of that home with you. So what's your procedure? What's your methodology behind dealing with that so it doesn't become burdensome on you in your daily life? You know, that's something I'm still working on. Um, mm-hmm. You know, it, it took me many years um, to, to get to where I am now, where at least I can go home and, and unwind a little bit and, um, and relax with, you know, friends and family. But it's, it's something that you have to actively work on. You have to really, first of all, uh, perform your best at work. So you can't go to work tired. You can't go to work hungry. You know, you have to take care of yourself physically. And then um, emotionally, it's just, it's, it's, a daily, it's a daily grind. Is there any um, physicians right now that you look up to um, that inspire you? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you know, I had a great mentor um, over my past 10 years that I've been working. And I just, I, I really look up to him for multiple reasons. He's a great human being, um, a great physician, spends so much time with his patients, um, and just really cares about them. And you can tell the difference between someone who really cares and someone who's just going through the motions. Mm-hmm. Have you had a student yet under you? Um, you know, we have NPs, PAs, um, and also when we were in training, we had students that would rotate through. So, yeah, that's, that's a fun part of medicine, to be able to teach what you know. Be someone's mentor. You know, maybe you'll be that to someone else. They're inspired by so. you. I hope so. Well, that's great. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Is there anything else that you want to share with us? Any like last minute advice for people thinking about becoming a doctor? It really is a great profession. I mean, you get to truly help people and make a difference in the world, but it, it is a commitment. And, um, you know, it takes a lot of your emotional energy. It takes a lot of your, um, your attention. So you, you really have to be passionate about, about this um, to go into the field of medicine. But it, it's so rewarding. I, I wouldn't change it for anything. 
Uh, so how, last question, how did you hear about Pacific Companies and how was your experience with Mr. Casey over here? It's been great. Casey has been so supportive and so helpful. Um, you know, he, he answers every question that I email him with. So I've just really had a great experience working with Pacific Companies. And not just for me, but within the recruiting process, what advice would you give to somebody who they're coming out of residency or they're looking for a new career if they're going to be contacted by a lot of recruiters? How, what advice would you give them on going through the process of deciding on which job to take? What's important to you to kind of look back and say, this is things that you should be on the lookout for, at least keep an eye out for? Yeah, I, th I think location is a... Um, is a very important factor. So if there's an area that you want to live in, definitely focus on that area. Um, in terms of recruiters, you know, get to know the recruiter because they're all different. So, um, you know, get to, get to know them, see what opportunities they have, and then kind of do your own reach outs as, as well. So if there's a particular company that you want to work for, um, you know, go ahead and reach out to them or reach out to a recruiter. And there's always opportunities out there. Yes, yeah, so would you suggest having physicians be proactive? Don't just rely on somebody reaching out to you. If you're looking for something, if you're looking for something specific, be proactive. Try to find exactly that or sit, because if you sit back and wait for things to come in, who knows what you're going to get. Absolutely, absolutely. That's great. Well, I can't believe we're already out of time. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Of course. Thank you to all our listeners. If you'd like to be notified when new episodes air, make sure to hit that subscribe button. And thank you to Pacific Companies. Without you guys, this podcast would not be possible. If you'd like to be a guest or for more information, go to www.pacificcompanies.com.